Good morning. Happy Thursday to everybody out there. I'm Brian Nemhauser. Uh, you can find me at Hawk Blogger on Twitter. And folks, it is a important Thursday morning because we are going to be talking about a position group that has not gotten, I don't think for my money, enough love in draft prep for the Seahawks. That's right. We are going to be talking about safety. Uh, safeties are a position that I think are a little bit controversial for probably good reason among Seahawks fans because we just finished cutting two of our starting safeties in Jamal Adams and Quandre Diggs. And part of the reason we did that is because there was too much invested in that position over other parts of the defense. And we're definitely not getting the, the return worthy of that level of investment. It was, I don't know the exact percentage, but it was a significant percentage of the cap going to just those two players. And you generally are not going to build difference making defenses from the back to the front. Uh, I, I think generally the best defenses are built the opposite way from the, the front to the back defensive line, defensive tackles, edge players, things of that nature. As much as I think horn, cornerbacks are really important. I would even put that above safety as a position of importance and the market bears that out. Cornerbacks are paid more than safety safeties across the NFL were cut loose. It was like the reckoning this year for veteran safeties, whether you were an all pro like Justin Simmons, whether you were a pro bowler like, you know, Quandre Diggs, whatever the case might be, there were safeties all across the NFL getting let go uh, for cap casualty reasons. And the only reason that something like that happened, especially in a year where the draft we'll get into this, is not super deep at that position, indicates that the position itself is being valued less than it has in previous years. So the Seahawks went from trading multiple first-round picks for a safety, who John Schneider now says they intended to play at will, which I'm, I don't know. I'm not going to get into all that. Also trading a fifth-round pick for Quandre Diggs, paying those guys a large chunk of change before that they had cam chancellor and earl thomas two of the best safeties of their era either hall of fame or borderline hall of fame players to now having probably one of the least expensive safety rooms in the nfl one of the least established safety rooms in the nfl and a group that doesn't have a lot of longevity in front of it either. I've talked about this before. Julian Love is in the last year of his deal. He made the Pro Bowl last year to his own surprise. Was not voted in by fans, was voted in by coaches and players, which I think does say something. And then you've got Rayshon Jenkins, who was let go in the safety culling that I was just talking about by the Jags and he's 30 years old and he's on a two-year deal. You got Kayvon Wallace on a one-year deal. And maybe you can talk about Kobe Bryant as a guy that played some safety who knows if that's where Mike McDonald sees him or if he sees him at all as part of this defense. But this is a very... You know, this is a this is a safety room that is not well footed and is a group that I would think the Seahawks would want to do something about. Now, if you look at their combine visits, if you look at their 30 visits, there's only one that I've seen so far that is for a safety, and that is Cam Kitchens out of Miami, who we will talk about as a prospect in this show. But there are not a lot of guys they've looked at. So does that mean that safety is not a position that they're going to explore? It could be. It could absolutely be. But we're going to talk about it anyway. I think it's important to do. And I think there's been some controversy about some of these prospects as well. So I'm eager to get into it. Before I do that, let me say good morning to uh, 
everybody, especially our YouTube members. Corey Hickok says, good morning, Brian. Good to be able to listen live again and not be stuck in meetings all morning for a change. Well, happy to have you, Corey. Thank you for joining. Uh, Hawks fan Matt Mann also says, good morning all. Good morning to you, Matt, and good morning to everyone in tuning in. It's a great time to join as a YouTube member. You will get a little emblem attached to your name, so I'll know when you've got comments, questions, and otherwise, and also things that we will share in the community section of the YouTube channel that only members will get access to. Uh, being a suite or club level member also gets you the chance to ask questions uh, when there's time in the show, and I'll let folks know. Uh, we did that yesterday. We'll do that on a continuing basis, so absolutely worth it to do club and suite level. And also go to patreon.com slash hawkblogger, sign up, get access to the Slack channel, get access to the audio version of all of these podcasts posted the same day immediately following the show. So you definitely want to do that. And the Slack channel is hundreds of folks talking about the Seahawks and the draft and all sorts of stuff all the time. It's a great way to get curated quality news. Um, I think it's a better place, safer place to trust the information you're getting than Twitter. So definitely encourage you to do that. Other couple things before we get into the safeties, uh, I wanted to call out a article on ESPN.com, and thanks to Jeff Simmons for giving me the heads up. I hadn't had a chance to read this one yet, but this is the latest that they're hearing, that folks are hearing from each of the teams. Matt Miller, who so far I've not been able to get on the show, Matt I think does a good job on his draft analysis. He is a 49ers fan though. So I don't know. I'm not sure I'm really upset that he's not on the show, but that's the, the reality. Anyway, what he is hearing about the Seahawks draft, he says the hiring of Mike McDonald as coach shifted how we view the Seahawks needs, but one constant has been defensive tackle. The Seahawks re-signed Leonard Williams in free agency, but sources with the team reiterated to me this week that number 16 is the floor for Texas defensive tackle Byron Murphy. Murphy's first step quickness and power are ideal in the three technique position and would boost the interior pass rush skills of this defense. Thanks again to Jeff for sharing that. I, I'm not surprised. And we're going to have done hours and hours of draft prep this year for the Seahawks draft. And we are likely going to end up in the same place where we started. If you remember, and you turn into the first few shows when we were talking about draft, my first choice was Byron Murphy, period. Like, no question. You, it's all up there for you to see. There's no debate. I was like, Byron Murphy would be my first choice by far. This was before he was being considered even a top 10 uh, selection. And I just, I think he's a great fit for what the Seahawks need. I think he's a, also a player with meaningful upside. At the time, this probably feels a little bit like ancient history. If you follow all this closely, we were talking about, yeah, but we could potentially trade back into the 20s and grab a guy like Troy Fountainew. Because at the time, he wasn't considered to be a top half of the first round prospect. You could go into any sim and get him in the 20s. Well, that has clearly changed. If you want him, you are going to have to get him at 16 if he's even available at 16. So now you are in a situation where if Matt Miller is accurate, if Byron Murphy is a stick and pick player for the Seahawks. They will not trade back if he's available. That has a really interesting ripple effect because now it really lines up with the way John Schneider approaches the draft. I, I, I think he is more likely to take a what he considers a difference making interior pass rusher than he is to take a difference making interior offensive lineman. I think that's true. I think it's also true that, as we've talked about, there is a more gradual drop-off at the interior offensive line position than there is at defensive tackle. 
So this could mean the Graham Bartons and the Fountain Font News of the world are not options for the Seahawks. And if that's true, then we're really more than likely talking about not adding a high ceiling interior offensive lineman to this group, which I think is a mistake. I think we're talking about probably using I mean, if, if you're taking at 16, then you're almost certainly only taking third round picks. So you're missing out everything in the second round. So that could be linebacker. I mean, I think you could really push the guard position to a little bit later if this is how he goes. Because where people say there's a, you know, there's more of a gradation between a, a gradual, uh, adjustment between the first round guards and the rest i would say it's even more gradual from the second round guards to the fourth round guards so the guys that you're going to get in the fourth round i don't think are meaningfully different than the guys you're going to get like it's like the difference between cooper bb and zach zinter and mason mccormick and um dominic pooney uh you know i think I don't see those as being massive differences. I'm going to blow my nose real quick. So hold on one sec. Sorry about that. So let's see. I mean, it's, it is one comment from one guy. If true, I think it's interesting and does make some sense. I continue to believe the best way to get elite talent at both interior offensive line and potentially a defensive tackle is to take guard first. I think only Fontenot and Graham Barton are guys to me that really are merit like top shelf interior line play. Who, by the way, also give you potentially either hedges at tackle and hedges at center with in the case of Barton. I just think those are two the, those are two of two in this draft. I don't think there's anyone else at their level and that's what we've heard from Brandon Thorne, that's what we've heard from Rob Rang, so we've heard from a lot of other folks as well. But I do think guys like Michael Hall Jr., Tavondre Sweat, um some of these other players that you might be able to get in the second round do have blue chip upside and I don't think there are guys like that on the interior offensive line so that's that's where it stands we'll see how this plays out I will not be upset if the Seahawks draft Byron Murphy period I think he's a very good player I'd be very he's exactly the kind of player the Seahawks have not added to their roster in the past it's the exact reason they've had to trade a two and a five to get a player like Leonard Williams and pay him 21 and a half million dollars a year because they just have it. They've ignored that position. They've gone cheap. And I don't think that you get cheap three techs that are any good. So um, I, I won't hate it, but I do think there are some flaws in that strategy. Um, Let me check one more thing, folks. So appreciate your patience here. Um, so this is before we get into safeties. So I appreciate your patience on that. Um, let's see. Uh, do, 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 do. Scrolling through. All right. Um, just to be clear, I know there's, there are folks asking some questions in chat. For folks, for the most part, I will be looking to answer questions from folks in club level or suite level in the live show. I will give priority reply in comments for anyone in Hawk's Nest and YouTube members. So uh, live show Q&A generally is going to be club level, suite level perk. So just FYI on that. Okay. Um, all right. Let's get into safety. Can we do that? I am eager to do that. And we are going to start... We are going to start with a player that is actually a cornerback. And 
There are varying perspectives about this player. You should know him by now. His name's Cooper DeGene. He's 21 years old. He's six foot one, 207 pounds. And we're going to go over a few different evaluations of Cooper DeGene. I am introducing today Dame Brugler's uh, Beast. The Beast 2024 was released yesterday. It is a 324 page collection of evaluations of players at almost every single position um, and goes into a lot of depth. So he will we'll go through some of his evaluations as well as Lance Erline, as well as the PFF Big Board, and we'll kind of talk about the similarities and differences. For Cooper DeGene, he lists he he only has cornerbacks and safeties as separate groups, and he lists Cooper DeGene as a corner. Um, but he does talk about him as a safety. So let me talk about what I get all the way back up to. Uh, he lists him as his fourth ranked corner for what it's worth. Terry and Arnold is first, Keenan Mitchell second, Nate Wiggins is third, and then Cooper DeGene is fourth. He gives him a first to second round grade. Um, overall, he has him at two. He has him as number 25 overall on his board. So even though somebody that's a first round pick, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily a first round grade. It's very common in scouting circles in NFL front offices to have less first round grades than there are first round picks. It's pretty typical for there to be about 20 players that get first round grades. Last year, the Seahawks said they only had 15 first round grades. Uh, so the fact that Dane Brugler has Cooper DeGene as the 25th ranked player on his board, despite saying he is a borderline first, second round pick, indicates kind of both things can be true. Uh, so a couple things of note here. Good sized athlete with above average speed. He's a member of Bruce Feldman's freaks list. That's a list of the most athletic freaks in the draft class. He's alert, disciplined, and smooth in his movements, which allow him to use a variety of techniques, bail, press, mirror, anticipated well, and credits his time as a high school quarterback for developing his feel and coverage. Interesting note there, Richard Sherman, one of the best cornerbacks, if not the best cornerback to ever play for the Seahawks, was a wide receiver all the way into college. And he absolutely talked about how that helped him develop anticipation for different route concepts and where what stems and what moments where the the, the players would take um, which cuts and allow him to anticipate so i think that is interesting uh, i hadn't realized that he was a high school quarterback there's also some great film of him as a basketball player just throwing down dunk after dunk so worth t checking that out if you haven't seen uh, finds the football and produces receiver-like plays at the catch point. Does fun things with the ball in his hands. Ret returned three of his seven career interceptions for touchdown. Touchdowns and saw a handful of offensive snaps. And was poised for more before his injury. Plays physical regardless of the down. And receivers know they're in for a dogfight. Reliable run defender and plays with outstanding control and hand strength as a tackler. Averaged 13.1 yards per punt return with one touchdown, had another one that was called back. Also a gunner on punt coverage, had 12 special teams tackles, humble and soft-spoken by nature, and deflects praise towards his teammates. Served on the team's player council as a sophomore and junior. NFL scouts say he can channel any nerves into a competitive performance, experienced playing multiple positions in the back seven. Um... Weaknesses, only average reaction burst and first step isn't as explosive as his full strides. Guilty of taking extra steps at the top of routes or in his change of direction, giving initial separation to receivers. Not shy about grabbing to recover and getting handsy downfield. Flag for pass interference against Purdue and Northwestern in 2023. Suffered a broken tibula in his right leg while practicing with the offense in November of 2023. So not, not that far ago. An injury which required season-ending surgery and sideline him for most of the draft process. Medically cleared 
in March of 2023. Summary. I won't go this full depth for each player, but I thought it was important for Cooper DeGene, who there's been a lot of discussion about. And I do see the super chats and some of the, the YouTube questions. I will get to those in a bit. Um, summary. A two-year starter at Iowa, DeGene is an inside-outside cornerback in his zone-heavy scheme. He also saw snaps at safety and the Hawkeyes' hybrid cash position. After matching the school record with three pick sixes in 2022, he's recognized as the Big Ten's defensive back of the year and the return specialist of the year in 2023, despite his late season leg injury. With his natural anticipation and coverage, DeGene is rarely out of position and uses athletic gifts and top tier ball skills to make plays. He allowed only one catch of 15 plus yards in 2023. Though he has a steady process to gather and goes, his lack of initial suddenness is something he must continue to mask to limit separation at the top of routes. Overall, DeGene is one of the best tackling defensive backs in the class and shows playmaking skills in coverage because of his athletic instincts and competitive makeup. Along with an immediate special teams role as a returner and a gunner, his NFL starter quality skill set fits interchangeably at cornerback, safety, or nickel. Now, folks, I know we've had folks on this show. We're going to have them again this weekend with C. Mike Spinmove, Griff Sturgeon, and Rob Staten, who are not big on Cooper DeGene necessarily. And certainly don't see him as a first round pick. I don't think he's a pick at 16. I think we're all in agreement there. I do think that he fits this hybrid mold that we heard Mike McDonald talk about. And he is arguably the most talented athlete at the safety position in this entire draft. And I think that matters. I think that matters. And I think that keeps him on the board. Let's take a look at who, what Lance Erline says. Okay. He has him rated a little bit lower. He has him as the sixth ranked cornerback. He does list him as a cornerback, which is what he played. He gives him a 6.3. And that is means for people that aren't familiar with the grading system that he uses, it's an eight point scale. It means he will eventually be a plus starter. He does have a little bit short arms, 31 and one eighth inch, just for what it's worth. Um, he says, highly competitive defensive back with plus ball skills and noteworthy special teams value. He is big and bundled for a cornerback with muscular arms and tight hips. He has fantastic interception production, but his movements are more linear than fluid. And he doesn't have an easy change of direction needed in man coverage on the next level. His best football is played with eyes forward. That's a safety. Using his instincts to challenge quarterbacks with his big downhill burst to smack whatever needs smacking. He would seem to be a no-brainer as a punt returner and gunner in year one. DeGene would be a big athletic tester, which will help get the hype train going. But finding the proper schematic fit will be important for unlocking his best football as a zone corner or interchangeable safety. So... He's uh, one AFC scout says he's quiet and humble. He's always the best. He was always the best at high school and he has baked in confidence that you cannot coach. So, I mean, still pretty positive as a safety. I think some of the questions are about at corner PFF on Cooper DeGene. He is their ninth ranked prospect on their big board, ninth overall. So they are the highest of high on him. Uh, interestingly, his coverage grade was not super high in 2023, 76.8. His run defense grade was 78.6. So he is a good run defender, especially for a corner. Um, he did only allow a 43% completion rate, uh, rate. Um, let's see what they say here. The talk of DeGene playing outside cornerback or safety or slot cornerback at the next level is not due to a lack of home position. It's because he could truly be an impact player anywhere. His footwork, ball skills, and explosive athleticism make him an impactful outside cornerback, one with all 
pro potential. He's a 21-year-old kid. I I don't understand the the hate here. I, I know for Rob State, and at least I understand for him, it is that he does not see enough snaps of him as safety to just say he is a safety. I think there's a lot of folks that are observing that he is really good in zone coverages where the plays are in front of him. He can read and react and is a super strong tackler. We just saw Kobe Bryant, who didn't play any safety in college, make the switch and is not nearly the athletic, uh, you know, you know, athlete that Cooper DeGene is. And he looked pretty good. And I think one of the reasons Kobe Bryant was good there is because I also think Kobe Bryant is best in like a man coverage or sorry, a zone coverage kind of thing where he can read and react. And so, I, yeah, I don't have the same concerns about Cooper DeGene at safety. I think that he is also a guy that gives you a hedge at cornerback. So just like we're talking about Fontenu being a hedge at tackle as well as guard and Barton being a hedge at center as well as guard, Cooper DeGene can be a hedge at corner as well as safety. And I think that's interesting because as we've talked about, Trey Brown is in the last year of his deal. Michael Jackson, I think, is in the last year of his deal. Uh, you've got Woolen and you've got Witherspoon, but you do need three corners. And so it could allow for some different things to happen um, in the cornerback room. So I think he is a worthwhile prospect. I don't, I don't, I'm not with the hate that has been sent his way. I think he is a really interesting player for the Seahawks. Okay. Um, let's take a look. Here, one second. So, Eric Tamura, um, one of our club level members, thank you, Eric, asks, talked about, talked a lot about accumulating picks in the current year, but curious if there's any insight into the quality of next year's drafts and should we consider trading for future picks? That's a really important question, Eric, and I have not, you know, we're still in the process of getting to know this year's class. I can't say that I've got as much insight into next year's class. There's not as strong of a cornerback or sorry, excuse me, quarterback class. Uh, generally speaking, it doesn't mean that there aren't good quarterback coming out, but you could be talking about, you know, the Alabama quarterback being towards the top. I saw something that said Quinn Ewers from Texas would be a potential top pick. I think that guy's absolute trash um maybe he'll be the jj mccarthy of next year where I'm like i don't get it but i thought he was i think he's a pretty shitty quarterback um but yeah I, I, as far as acquiring picks next year i think the bigger question is do you trade away future picks to get more picks this year I think that could happen. I certainly am a fan of that for later round picks because I think that those are going to continue to be less valuable with NIL and college, keeping a lot more of the kind of mid-level prospects in college, making money as opposed to going to the NFL. So I think picks from like the fifth round on are just going to decrease in value. And if you can get something for bundling those together, even fourth round pick potentially, they should consider that. But I don't know enough about next year's class to really give you a great answer there. Thank you for the question, though, Eric. And thank you for being a club level member. Um, another question from a club level member, 67 plus. Brian, what do you want most in a safety? What trait? Cam's enforcement, Earl's field coverage, Quandre's ball skills. I want someone like... I want someone elite at what they do and, and like what the, I want them to have an elite trait. And I think that's kind of what you're getting at with this question. It sounds like now we've had already a little bit of daylight between what John Schneider has said and what Mike McDonald has said about defense. For example, John Schneider said, you know, Baker is the will Dodson is the mic and Mike McDonald literally like the next week at the coaches meeting was, well, we're not going to really have as clear positions at that, those spots. They're going to be pretty interchangeable. All right. So that those are different statements on the safety side. 
John Schneider has said they're going to play more split safety. That implies less center fielder range as a really big priority. So when you talk about, you know, Earl's coverage, that was his strength as he could cover sideline to sideline as good or better than anybody in his generation at the safety spot and allowed the Seahawks to play a single high safety in a two safety set where you got, you know, too deep. You don't need that kind of range. I do think that run support is is pretty important um, because you both need to be able to interchangeably move up toward the line. And there's not as much of a free safety, strong safety split in a lot of those situations. So I think this is really about being well-rounded. What I personally value the most and what I want is someone who can contribute to run defense. And that sounds crazy, but I don't want to have a safety who makes business decisions like we saw Quandre make for a lot of the last couple of years. And I think that is a key part of making the defense more physical, harder to get big plays against. Um, I think that you can have decent athleticism and at the safeties position still be able to stay over the top of receivers. You're given a huge advantage with where you are on the field. So I think in Mike McDonald's defense, being able to have a mixture of, of skill sets to where you can even be a blitzer is important. So I don't know if this is going to be as much a single trait kind of defense for safety as we saw with Pete Carroll's where you really did want a box safety and a free safety. In this one, it's going to be more of a well-rounded player. And that's where somebody like, you know, you look at the guys they signed. I mean, they have Julian Love, so they didn't get to choose that. But I think he's a good fit for it anyway. And then Rayshon Jenkins is kind of more of a box safety, but he has definitely been able to play in coverage, Made was one of the best receivers or best safeties in terms of coverage last year um, by certain metrics. So I think more physical than in previous the previous regime with Quandre Diggs. Um, but yeah, I like, it's hard for me to just say one thing. I want them to be fast. I want them to hit like a ton of bricks and I want them to make plays in the football. Like that's, that's probably the thing that I would, uh, I would call out. So thank you for the question. And thank you for being a club level member. Garth Knight with super chat. Thank you. Says Brian, I love Tyler Newbin and cam kitchens. Where are those cats going to go per draft next? We will get to those guys. That is a good, good question. Um, good, good question. Let's get to it. Let's get back to it. So we just talked about Cooper DeGene. Now let's get into the guys. There are probably other cornerbacks that could be considered safety. I don't know if we're going to run into them. And Dane Brugler's group, they're they're separated out. So I, I'm not sure I'll, I'll find all of those. Um. He has as his number one safety on the list. Now, this remember, Cooper DeGene was listed as a corner, so he probably is the number one safety. But the number one pure safety is Jaden Hicks from Washington State. He gives him a second round grade. This guy's six foot one, almost six foot two, 215 pounds, ran a four, five, 40, one, five, eight split, 31 and a half inch arms, 21 and a half years old. What did he say about Jaden Hicks? Um, Jaden Hicks, one of five children, was born and raised in Las Vegas. His parents were both college athletes. Um, let's just kind of, I don't care about some of this stuff. Uh, his father often coached him, and he played up several grade levels to help develop football skills. Hicks attended Las Vegas football powerhouse Bishop Gorman High School. Three-year letterman in the secondary. Um, teammates with several future players like Roma Dunze. After biding his time on the freshman and JV teams, he got his taste of RC action as a sophomore. He had 10 tackles. Uh, let's keep looking through this. Um, okay, let's get to the strengths. I didn't want all this background. Sorry. Uh, he looks the part with the frame of a small linebacker and athleticism of a corner rangy run defender and flies downhill from depth to contain outside runs or make stops behind the line 
Mirrors well laterally when asked to play in the box. Stout, physical striker, looks to tune up his target and dislodge the football at contact. Former high school cornerback, cornerback, and covers tight ends well in man coverage. That's pretty appealing so far. Has a feel for zone coverage and understands how to balance the sight lines between the pocket and routes. Will take advantage of mistakes by the quarterback. See pick six versus Colorado State in 2023. Has a knack for disguising his intentions pre-snap and brings the noise as a blitzer with his top-down closing speed. Coach has put a lot on his plate and tested his versatility across multiple positions. Durable and played in every game the last two seasons, including 23 consecutive starts. Weaknesses. He's high cut and needs to clean up his tackling form. Doesn't always see what he tackles. And misses are usually from dropping his eye level and prematurely leaving his feet. Anticipation and efficiency sorting through his keys should continue to prove with experience. Late to locate climbing blocks and can do better job with uh, his take on hands. Ball hawking skills lessen the further away from the line of scrimmage. Some NFL scouts have voiced concern about him growing out of safety. Wasn't used as a regular on special teams coverage in 2023. Summary. Two-year starter at Washington State, Hicks played strong safety in defensive coordinator Jace Jeff Medling's 425 base and was asked to play the deep half, deep middle in the box and over the slot. A late bloomer when he arrived in Pullman, the coaches kept putting more and more on his plate, and he developed into one of the top defensive backs in the Pac-12. With his versatile skill set, Hicks has the speed to play high and the toughness to play low. Filling the alley with urgency, covering big targets in space. All his, although his read anticipations are a work in progress, he plays confident and free, and his athletic instincts, instincts help him to make plays. Overall, Hicks is a rangy, intimidating presence, both downhill and on the back end, and he offers multi-dimensional traits to develop into an NFL starter. He projects as a scheme-friendly safety who should continue to contribute immediately on special teams. Sounds a lot like what I just described, right? Um, he's got him as a second round grade, number 39 overall. So a high second round kind of player. And that's appealing. Let's see where he falls with Mr. Zerline. Jaden Hicks is much lower for Zerline, he is the seventh ranked safety. I'm not going to read as much about him. He has given a 6.15 grade, good backup with the potential to develop into a starter. Um, he says Hicks testing will be extremely important for his draft outlook. Well, he did have his testing. Straight line mover will have some issues when asked to flow with big bending breaks. However, he plays with good in instincts, has impressive ball skills, and can line up over pass catching tight ends. There are qualities to a game that can make him a feast or famine safety, but ultimately he has traits um, and upside to be bet on in the middle rounds. I'm going to check one other thing with Mr. Hicks. Um, yeah, so Jaden Hicks Raz score was 8.95, which ranked 115 out of 1,082 free safeties from 1987 to 2024. <clears throat> uh, his size grade was great. His explosion grade was good. He did have an 84th percentile vertical leap. Um, his agility grade was good, although his shuttle was not. Um, his shuttle was 43rd percentile. His three cone was 83rd percentile. 40-yard dash at 4.5 was 83rd percentile and was good. So if athletic testing was Lance Zerline's big concern, I think he did pretty well um, by a RAS score. Uh, let's see where he is. On the PFF big board, he is 61. So right in between probably where Mr. Uh, Zerline and where uh, Dame Brugler have him. Uh, his grades really grew from 2021. He was 46.5, 2022, 70, or 66. And then 2023, he was 76. His coverage grade was 83. His run defense grade was 65. Um 
So uh, they call him Hicks is a well-built, strong safety who can play at all three levels of the field. He's a tone setting tackler and has starting potential in two safety systems, especially as a strong safety robber over the middle. So I think that is worth knowing. Um, seems like a good fit for the Seahawks. Um, and I am getting word. Uh, thank you, Garth Knight, that OJ Simpson has passed away. I don't have a lot to say on this. Uh, it is news. Certainly a guy that had a meaningful life. I'll put it that way. Um, all senses. For me growing up, he was naked gun um, with Leslie Nielsen more than football. Uh, and then obviously what happened later in his life was much more disturbing. And uh, for anyone who is close to him, you know, send out my best. Um, so OJ Simpson has passed away. All right. Um, getting back to it. I, I guess what I'll say there is Jaden Hicks is certainly an interesting prospect for the Seahawks. I think he fits a lot of what they're looking for. Uh, all right. Next on Dane Brugler's list is a guy I, I'm really fond of. I admit, I admit it. I'm going to be very biased here. Uh, Javon Bullard from Georgia. He has got him as a second to third round pick. One of the challenges we're probably going to hear about this is his size. He's 5'10". So he's like, he's like a little dude. I think Earl Thomas, Earl Thomas height was 5'10". That's what I thought. Earl Thomas was 5'10". He played pretty well. So let's not, let's not hate on him too much. 5'10", 198 pounds, 447. In fact, I got to do it. I'm going to do mock draftable. For Javon Bullard. Uh, I was just curious if, if, if anything showed up there. Um, no, he does not match up closely with uh, Mr. Thomas other than his height. Uh, all right. So Javon Bullard, what does he have to say? Dame Brugler about Javon Bullard. Sturdy, well-developed upper body, terrific short area quickness with strong closing speed and split field range. So asked earlier my thoughts that I want. I mean, I just love guys that come up and hit. I just do. I will always love that. And I saw that so many times from Bullard. Like this guy is a physical player and he loves to smack people with the ball. Head coach Kirby Smart describes his hitting ability, quote, like a little stick of dynamite. Come on. How can you not want that guy? Strokes, ball carriers across the middle. I'm not sure strokes is the word I'd use there. Um, I think he means strikes. Maybe that's a typo. <laughs> that makes more sense. Hard guy to keep blocked because of the way he can punch off contact. Plays with physicality and pursuit level of a box run defender. Quickly able to course correct and take piercing angles to the football sharp zone eyes and has the peripheral vision to pick up crossers sort through route combinations in high school and college coaches agree that he has a future in coaching because of his mental toughness confident competitor and regarded as one of the team leaders and best personalities in the georgia locker room experienced at multiple positions in the secondary and on kick and punt coverages as far as weaknesses lacks high-end athletic traits Undersized frame by NFL standards with short arms. Aggressive play style will can um, get overzealous at times. Feels like he needs to get handsy at the top of routes to slow down receivers. That happens when you're a little bit limited as an athlete. Choppy pedal and might not have the balance to cover NFL slot receivers. Hard to find any blitzing reps on his 2023 tape. Charged with driving under the influence in September 2022. Suspended for one game. Uh, including f holding a phone while driving, not using headlights and possessing of alcohol by a person under 21. Not great. Missed two games as a junior because of a sprained left ankle. Summary, a two-year starter at Georgia. Bullard played the field safety role 
in a 3-3-5 scheme, but also saw reps in the box and the slot. The lowest ranked recruit in Smart's 2022 recruiting class, he played the star nickel position in 2022 before moving to free safety. He didn't allow a touchdown in coverage during the 2023 season. With his swagger fitting up the run, Bullard is assignment sound as a down safety where he can quickly diagnose, drive, and make plays on the football. He has the eyes, eye balance to rapidly read routes, although his timing will need to be pristine to cover NFL receivers and tight ends. Overall, Bullard doesn't have the ideal size or length, but he's ultra instinctive and makes his presence felt at all three levels. His skill set fits best as a hybrid nickel defender who can handle box duty, disguise his intentions, and drop into space. He's got him as a second to third round grade, number 53 overall. Again, like I just love this guy. <laughs> I'm a huge fan. Uh, let's see where Mr. Zerline has him. He has him as his third ranked safety. Uh, 6.25 grade will eventually be an average starter. Um, Bullard isn't a clean fit at full time nickel and might lack the length and range teams seek from a split safety, but he's a good football player with field awareness teams are looking for. He's going to be a little tight with lateral movements, which could create some throwing windows and missed tackles. But his route recognition, angles, and pursuit help to stabilize his play. There will be some challenging matchups, but Georgia's provided the blueprint by playing him as a big nickel with run support and modest man cover duties. With the right fit, Bullard should develop into a quality NFL starter. He is number 48 on the PFF uh, big board, which is above Jaden Hicks. And below one of the guys we will talk about soon in Tyler Newbin. What they have, uh, they gave him an 82.8 grade this year. His coverage grade was 88.4. His run defense grade was actually only 67.1. Um, Bullard is a versatile secondary player with fearless, fearless mentality. Though he isn't an elite athlete, his competitive quick competitiveness quickness and tackling ability projecting him to a starting role as a nickel defender so maybe not your starting split safety but maybe like the Kayvon wallace future player um could be the fit with javon bullard let's talk about the number three prospect on dane brugler's list which is tyler newbin in a lot of places, he is the number one prospect. Um, uh, he is, like I said, number three. He's from Minnesota, six foot one, 205 pounds, four, five, nine, 40. Not great. This is what really hurt him. He was a first round, borderline first round pick. He did not test well. He's 22, it's almost 23 years old, so a little bit on the older side. But he is six foot one, 205 pounds. Brugler gives him a second to third round grade. Okay. What does he have to say about Mr. Newbin? Broad filled out frame, rangy athleticism allows him to make plays from various alignments in the secondary, sees the field with instinctive eyes and whole field vision to simultaneously track route combinations in the eyes of the quarterback. Looks like a wide receiver at the catch point. We heard that about Cooper DeGene as well. Collected more interceptions than any player in Minnesota history. There's been some comparisons. He he was behind Antoine Winfield in college and, you know, then broke all his records. Zero coverage penalties over the past two seasons. That's an interesting note. Physical and run support and flash a short area burst when working downhill. Breaks down well in the open field, dropping his pads and extending his arms to limit misses. Was a regular on special team coverage in all five seasons, including a career high in 2023. Learned how to practice and watch film from Antoine Winfield when he was teammates. Always directing traffic on defense. Teammates say his competitiveness is infectious and elevates the rest of the team. Pretty glowing. Uh, weaknesses is movements show hints of tightness. Pedal and transitions are more efficient than explosive. Ultra protective of his deep responsibilities and gets stuck on his heels, allowing too many front facing completions. So guy that wants to make sure he doesn't get beaten deep would have been a <laughs> so Pete Carroll would have liked that. 
Um, but maybe gives up some things in front of him, which Pete Carroll's players also did. A cornerback turned safety. He led the Gophers in interceptions in each of the last four seasons and collected his 13th career interception in the final home game, which set a new school record. Using as athleticism and awareness, Newbin keeps everything in front of him and can drive off the numbers in the deep half to overlap the seam or track speed and finish the post. As an alley defender, he is fearless but controlled. He comes to balance with low pads to finish tackles. Overall, Newbin has conservative tendencies in coverage, but he's a four down player with a coveted skill set because of his split field range, playmaking instincts, and toughness versus the run. He's ideally suited for a quarters based cover two scheme in the NFL and will be a core special teamer. So that's Brugler's read. Where does Lance Zerline see him? Zerline has him as the top safety. Okay. Brugler had him as the third safety. Uh, Zerline compares him. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Uh, Zerline compares him to Marcus Williams, who is a key safety where Baltimore with the Ravens. Um, all right. Zerline says talented safeties prospect with size, length, and instincts that teams are looking for to shore up the back end. Newbin has the ability to play as an interchangeable safety but will make money as a ball thief. He's rangy over the top in two high safety looks, plays chess in the middle of the field using instincts to think along with the quarterback and pounce on throws from that angle. He's average in man coverage and might lack ideal top end speed, but his anticipation and discipline help make up for that. He's capable in run support, but his pursuit angles get him beat outside. Newbin's traits, instincts, and ball skills give him an opportunity to become a successful long-term starter. Um, that's glowing. He is the top safety in PFF. So third on Brugler's first in Lance Zerlines and first in PFF, he gets a 26th spot on their big board. So in the first round, I don't think that's probably where he will go, but that's where he is ranked. One sec. Okay, um, they give him an 89.2 grade this last year, 90 grade in coverage, 70 grade in run defense. Um, his average passer rating allowed or his passer rating allowed was 39.6, which is remarkable. Again, five interceptions, allowed a couple touchdowns. Um, Newbin possesses athleticism, football IQ, and run defense potential to be a versatile and impactful safety in any scheme though he would likely make the most plays in a system that consistently uses two deep coverages, allowing him to play free robber and box safety roles. Newbin's an interesting dude. He's an interesting dude. Um, certainly for the Seahawks. I don't know if he will be around when they'll be picking. He seems like he is likely a second round pick, but could be with his athletic profile could drop into the third round. And what we talk about at the beginning of the show, um, safeties are not being valued in the same way. So, and and to give you some idea, his RAS score, we talk about all the great RAS scores. He had a 3.67 RAS score. Okay. That ranked 672 out of 1,060 safeties since 1987. His only... I mean, he had an 80th percentile height grade. His bench, he only benched 10 times. One That's like 14th percentile. Uh, his vertical jump, 24th percentile. So his explosion grade was poor. Broad jump, 64th percentile. Speed grade. His 40-yard dash was 70th percentile, but his 10-yard split was 32nd percentile. His agility grade was poor. His shuttle was 17th percentile. His three cone was 38th percentile. So this is the challenge is you've got to really wonder about his athletic ability and how that translates to the NFL. Tedrick Thompson, if you remember, made a shit ton of plays 
in Colorado. And that's one of the things that Pete Carroll talked about. And they liked that he was a playmaker. He made almost no plays in the NFL because he wasn't an NFL athlete. So you got to be careful with these guys that have all this tape in college, but then really that, that step, that half a step difference in how they can approach the NFL makes them not the same player. Um, I'm curious. I'm going to see if I can pull this up. Um, since he was compared to Marcus Williams, Marcus Williams was a second round pick in 2017. Uh, let me just double check. Is that right? Yes. Um, he had an 8.0 Raz. So 80th percentile. Different dude. Um, his vertical and broad jump were 99 and 94th percentile. His shuttle was 63rd percentile. His three cone was 82nd percentile. I do think, you know, it's a good, it's an interesting comparison. That's cool. But man, that's big difference in terms of the type of athlete. So a little bit of concerning about Nubin. Exciting to read what everyone says about him. I personally... I'm always hesitant to take questionable athletes. Um, just period, especially high up in the draft. So I don't know. I mean, we talked about Bullard. Bullard was not that questionable. <laughs> he was, uh, you know, I want to just make sure I remember where Bullard was. Um, he, yeah, right, right. He was an 80 second. He's an 8.2. So that is a very different. He had great agility grades. He had great speed grades, like elite. So different, different kind of athletic questions there. Jaden Hicks still seems like an interesting guy so far. Cooper DeGene seems interesting. Let's keep going. Next guy on Brugler's big board is Cole Bishop, another guy that we have talked about quite a bit. Um, he is six foot two, 206 pounds, 21 and a half years old. He has a second to third round grade, number 70 overall on um, Brugler's board. I'm going to read the summary. I'm not going to go through because I want to get to more corners. So I'm just going to read the summary here. A three year starter at Utah. Bishop was a multi dimensional safety in a 4 2 5 scheme. Some safeties play fast and others play controlled. Bishop does both. Because of the way he always rallies to the football, regardless of his origin point, would rotate single high to the box, to a rolled up cornerback, to a nickel backer, and several other positions in between. Having grown up in a New England Patriots fan, Bishop models his game after Rodney Harrison, and it shows in his competitive demeanor and the way he wastes zero time getting to the football. Although he has some limitations in man coverage, he has he can cover tight ends and shows terrific vision in zone to diagnose route combinations and drive on the football. Overall, Bishop needs to put more impact plays on tape by setting traps for quarterbacks and coverage, but he plays with top-down explosiveness and the football IQ to make plays at all three levels um, of the field. He has NFL starter caliber talent and is ideally suited for a robber role. Sounds like a lot of these guys are suited for robber roles. Where does Lance Zerline have... Mr. Bishop, he has him as the fourth ranked safety. So pretty high up. Uh, eventually will be an average starter. Again, six foot two, ran a four, four, five, 40 with a 39 inch vertical, 10, four broad. Bishop was a highly productive tackler, tackler and valuable three-year starter at Utah. He stays busy around the line of scrimmage and can dart into gaps, but can be a little slow playing off big blockers. Bishop has coverage potential on tight ends and is a bona fide striker when crashing down from his zone perch. He balances pursuit flow with last line of defense mentality as a run defender from high safety, but will lose discipline in his deep safety duties at times. Bishop is an enforcer with NFL size and toughness for consideration in both down safety and split safety alignments. On PFF's big board, Cole Bishop is much farther down. He's 120th. 
well down the list. Um, they do not have any analysis for him, but they do have, he got a 60.9 coverage grade, 67.5 run defense grade. He had a 13% missed tackle rate. I think that was one of the concerns that Nathaniel Ernst brought up on our show last night. Um, for what it's worth, Jaden Hicks had a 14.7% missed tackle rate. Javon Bullard had a 10.8% missed tackle rate. Tyler Newbin had a 9.4% missed tackle rate. Okay. So that's Cole Bishop. Um, interesting player. I really appreciate this notion of him being nickel backer. I think he's one of those, again, hybrid players. And depending on where he goes, could be a guy that's interesting for the Seahawks. Let's keep going. Uh, number five on Dane Brugler's list is the one safety the Seahawks have had for a visit either at the combine or in their 30 visits. It is Cam Kitchens. Cam Kitchens is 5'11", 202 pounds. He's 21 and a half years old. Brugler has him as a third round grade, 79th overall on his list. Um, a three-year starter at Miami. Kitchens was a field post safety and defensive coordinator Lance Gidry's scheme, but played more of a nickel role in 2022. A highly productive player. He led the ACC in interceptions as both a sophomore and junior. He was the only player in college football with double digit combined interceptions over the last two seasons. And the first Miami player to reach at least 10 career interceptions since Sean Taylor. Always good to have your name mentioned with that guy. Although he lacks explosive speed and has risk-taking tendencies that are worrisome, Kitchens anticipates well from depth and has the range to play over the top and properly track the football. He can rotate down as a robber and be a factor in the run game too. Overall, Kitchens does not have top-tier athletic traits, but he has a well-balanced skill set and the playmaking awareness and ball skills to compete for a starting role in the NFL. He projects best as a split field safety with range in the post who can drive top down into two deep shells. Okay. Um, I wanted to pull up the Raz score for Mr. Kitchens, and I should do it in retrospect for um for Cole Bishop. Um Cameron Kitchens. Uh, okay. Ooh, ooh, ay, ay, ay. That is a rough, rough Raz score. Um, twenty third percentile. Yikes. Size grade is okay. Thirty ninth percentile height. Sixty sixth percentile weight. 40th percentile in bench. His explosive grade is poor. 58th percentile vertical leap. Oh my gosh, his broad jump is under one percentile. <laughs> it's, it's in the zero percentile range. Never seen that before. Not good. Composite speed grade, poor. 40 yard dash, 37th percentile. 10 yards split, split 34th percentile. He did not do agility testing. Um, that's concerning. Let's just see what other people say about him. Let's uh, go to Lance Zerline, who has Cam Kitchens well down his list, much farther down his list. Um, he gives him a 6.14. Good backup with the potential to develop into a starter. Safety prospect with toughness, instincts, and ball skills to handle NFL work, although his lack of speed could give teams pause. Kitchens is willing run supporter near the box, hits with message-sending purpose over the middle, and plays with outstanding range as a high safety. Despite the positive tape and attributes at his disposal, he made mistakes in run support and coverage that led to big plays and, in some cases, touchdowns. If he can eliminate the mental mistakes and take better angles to the ball as an open field tackler, he will improve his consistency, but Kitchens' poor speed Testing at the NFL scouting combine could limit how teams will want to use him. Um, eesh. okay. Where is he on 
PFF, he is 87th on PFF. So again, he was 79th for Dame Brugler. He is 87th. So similar range. Got a 67.8 grade last year. 65 coverage, 69 run defense. Neither one great. 13.7% missed tackle. Uh, Kitchens is a solid all-around athlete. Is he, though? With a good eye for the quarterbacks are going with the ball. He possesses great ball skills to come down with interceptions and anticipate throws. A little lighter in size. He is projected as a potential starter at free safety. Um, I don't know, guys. I don't know. I, I have questions about these low-testing athletes. I I want I want guys that can make elite plays. Um, and at the NFL level, you usually have to be an elite athlete to do that. By comparison, since I did not do Cole Bishop's RAS score, I just want you to know his RAS score is 98th percentile, 9.88, almost 99th percentile. He has elite speed grades, 93rd percentile. He has uh, great explosion grades, 91st percentile. He has great size grades, 91st percentile height, 76th percentile weight. He did not do agility testing, so take that into account. But um, that's a much better athletic profile. Um, we've got a super chat here from Garth Knight that says, so basically only a corner cornerback can be a safety. I don't know where you're getting that necessarily. Um, I just, uh, <laughs> I think when you're talking about guys, like we were just talking about with Cam Kitchens being a 23rd percentile athlete at the position of safety, not of cornerback. So this is all safeties that have been tested. He's one of the worst athletes that's ever been tested at that position. That's a concern. Tyler Newbin. That's a concern. I mean, Newbin was uh, 36 percentile, you know, at safety. So, so I think that these are concerning numbers. Um, and if you want to look at other safeties that have, if you want to give me some examples of unathletic safeties that have succeeded in the NFL, I'm happy to look up their RAS scores and see where they fit. I'd love to be getting evidence that subpar athletes at the safety position can be good safeties. Um, even, you know, we were just talking about Quandre Diggs. Quandre Diggs came into the NFL as a nickel corner and moved to safety. Uh, all right, so let's keep going. That was Cam Kitchens. Not great. Now we get to one of my favorite players in this draft, um, Malik Mustafa, 5'10", 206 pounds, 20... 21, almost 22 years old. Uh, do, 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 do. So I'm going to read everything about him because I just, I love this guy. Uh, strengths, compact, burly frame. Looks like a mini linebacker with his packed on muscle. Explosive striker and run support. By the way, this is a guy, Eric McClain from the ACC Network, just glowed about. Um, brings his feet as a tackler and ball carriers usually go backwards at contact. Does a great job flying downhill and calming his feet to square up ball carriers. Quickly finds the ball near the line of scrimmage to scrape, knife, literally, laterally and find the lane. Smooth in his pedal to turn and play the post and close with range of the sideline. Stays disciplined on pump fakes and attempts to draw him, that attempt to draw him out of position. Didn't commit a penalty in his four-year college career. That's kind of wild. To be that big of a hitter, and to play safety and never, yeah, anyway, that's crazy. Innately motivated and coaches speak highly of his intellect and competitive drive. Often limited his offensive and defensive linemen to push himself. Often lifted with the offensive and defensive linemen to push himself. So he he lifted weights with guys much larger to kind of push himself. Um, has experience as a gunner and was a regular on kick coverage. Weaknesses, undersized and lacks ideal height or length. Struggles to escape climbing blocks once they swallow him up. Occasionally overruns outside angles, creating cutback opportunities for runners. Lacks suddenness at the top of routes. Can be caught in his heels. A half beat late to unlock from depth as he processes run or pass. 
below average on ball production and coverage makes plays he should not but consistently creating um interceptions suffered a torn acl in 2021 uh, summary, a two-year starter at Wake Forest, Mustafa was a field safety in a hybrid scheme, playing a Panther position on third down, single high, slot, and edge stunts. After transferring from Richmond, he gradually established himself as the heart of the Wake Forest defense, earning all ACC honors as a captain. Modeling his game after Buda Baker, Mustafa delivers immediate stopping power as a tackler and does a great job balancing power and poise to stay under control as a finisher. Though he reads plays development well in coverage, he lacks the twitch to stay connected in man-to-man or overlap zones. Overall, Mustafa doesn't have the tape of an instinctive ball hawk, but he is a passionate competitor with outstanding range versus the run and disciplined moments in coverage with a skill set similar to Jordan Whitehead. He could shine on special teams in the NFL and push for defensive snaps early in his career. Third round grade, 84th overall for Dame Brugler. See where Mr. Zerline has him. Mr. Zerline has him way down the list. Uh, Has a 5.98 grade on him, which is an average backup or special teamer. Um, He lacks the desired height and length. Uh, will be in consideration as a down safety who can help support against the run and handle short and intermediate zone coverages. Not overly instinctive, but does play with a good burst on throws and well-timed challenges. He struggles against bigger targets and might not be the best to handle single or too high safety looks. There are occasional mistakes with aggressive downhill angles to ball carriers, but he's generally in position and maintains tackle-ready posture. He projects as an average backs up, backup, but does possess some quality play traits play traits i should say um he is well down on the pff big board at 165 uh 79.6 grade last year 72 in coverage 87.5 in run defense um did have a 12.4 percent missed tackle rate Mustafa has a, a skill set and mentality of a throwback strong safety. He does not have the fluidity or long speed to be relied upon in single high roles, but his toughness, power, and motor make him an ideal depth safety to draft and develop, likely starting in a special teams role. Um, if you're curious, uh, let's see. He had a... 90 9.38 90 almost 94th percentile raz score which ranks 68 out of 1082 safeties since 1987 um elite explosion grade good speed grade did not do agility testing okay let us move on i'm going to start cherry picking a few guys here and i'm going to go from different so we're going to talk about uh dadrian taylor demerson next he is number two on lance zerline's prospect list gets a 6.28 grade which will mean he'll eventually be an average starter he's 510 another shorty 197 pounds short arms 30 and 7 eighths inches um he compares him to jordan whitehead Taylor Demison might not have the highly coveted measurables that teams will gravitate toward, but he brings plenty of instinct and ball skills. He offers coverage versatility as a split safety, high safety, and nickel. He's quick enough to handle man coverage. He plays with outstanding anticipation to steal from quarterbacks and sh- who show their cards. His uh, aggression will create some negative plays, and his tackling might never be more than average. Taylor Demerson's versatility, football IQ, and production, and consistent ball production align with what defense coordinators are looking for and should make him a solid starting defensive back. Um, he is number 99 on the PFF big board. 78.5 grade, 76 coverage, 76 run, 10.2 missed tackle rate. And let's see where he falls on Mr. Brugler's. He is number seven on Mr. Brugler's list. 
Um, he gives him a third to fourth round grade, 96 overall. He says, overall, Taylor Demison is undersized and his aggressive trigger backfires at time, but his explosive post-split field range jumps off the screen and allows him to make plays on the ball in coverage and run support. His speed and developing instincts give him a starting potential as a free safety or nickel cornerback, but the rough edges in his game might never smooth out, which would keep him as a backup and special teamer. Um, do, 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 do. Taylor Demerson, just taking a quick look here. Um, he gets an eight, uh, 81st percentile RAS score. So not bad. His speed grade was elite 96 percentile, 44, 40 yard dash four, four, one in the 40 yard dash, uh, 89th percentile, 10 yard split. His agility grade was just okay. Uh, 33rd percentile shuttle, 67th percentile three cone. Explosion grade was great. Size, poor. So 5'10 and 197 is just a little bit small, but overall a pretty good athlete, um, at least by Raz's perspective. Let's talk about some other guys here um, as we keep going down the list. I am curious about James Williams. So let's see where he falls. Um, James Williams uh, gets a 6.14 grade from uh, Mr. Zerline. Good backup with potential to develop into a starter. He is six foot four, so he's not a shorty, right? 33 and 5 eighths inch arms, 231 pounds. This is like linebacker size. 231 pounds at safety is nuts. Um, he's a physical safety with long athletic frame. While it's fun watching him run and strike from high safety is much less fun watching his coverage confusion. He doesn't see the game as clearly as teams might like right now, but he has the athleticism and cover skills to tighten up the windows and tight ends and man coverage. Williams might need a year to add weight and keep add weight and keep working on his game, but his traits and playing demeanor should earn him a role as a box safety or, excuse me, as nickel linebacker. I don't know, 231 pounds. I don't know why you're adding weight. Uh, PFF has him, ooh, well down, uh, 169th on their list. 85.5 coverage grade, 64.8 run defense, 14.8 missed tackle rate. Uh, okay. Dame Brugler. Where does he have him? Did I pass him? Or is he way down this list? I don't know. Let's see. He is 18th. Oh, he has him as a linebacker. That's why. <laughs> um, interesting. Yeah, that makes more sense to me. Overall, Williams is more of a tweener athlete than a seasoned football player, but he's a full throttle enforcer with a unique skill set that will intrigue several NFL defensive coordinators. He protects best as a robber cover three scheme and offers versatility in sub packages to blitz or match tight ends. Yeah. So that's James Williams, who I guess, I mean, I can't imagine a six foot four, 300 or 231 pound guy playing safety in the NFL. <laughs> that seems, that seems wild to me. Um, Okay, uh, let's get back to where I was. One sec. Whoops. Apologies. Just having some technical difficulties. All right, we're back. Um, so we've talked about a bunch of guys. I think we got to talk about... Dominique Hampton. 
Um, this is a guy that we've talked about a lot. I think we'll cover him and then we'll color, cover Kalen Bullock and we'll call it a day. Actually, we'll cover Sione Vaki as well. So three guys I want to cover. Um, so Dominic Hampton. Oh, sorry. Let's let's cover Dominic Hampton. He is number nine on Brugler's list. Six foot two, 213 pounds. Obviously a Husky for folks that know Washington football. He's got him as a fourth round grade. Overall, Hampton is undisciplined with his man coverage responsibilities, but he's an impressive size speed athlete who diagnoses well from zone and is an explosive striker as a tackler. He projects as a team's third safety who can impact all three levels of the field and contribute as a gunner special teams standout. On Lance Zerline's list. He is relatively well down. He's above Malik Mustafa, but still pretty far down the list. Gives him a sixth grade traits or talent to be an above average backup. Average game film has to be weighed against his traits and the potential of what he could do with pro coaching. Hampton is big, fast, and long, and defensive coordinators would love to work with that. He's more comfortable operating as a read and react high safety than in man coverage. He's willing in run support, but erratic angles as to tackle. Um, and below average body control to lead to poor positioning and excessive arm tackles. Hampton's traits and potential could sway a team to take him on day three and develop him into an average backup with core special teams value. So not a glowing grade there from Mr. Zerline. Um, he is even less glowing on PFF. He's a 233rd ranked prospect on their big board. Well down the list. Got a 662 Overall grade, 67.4 in coverage, 66 in run defense, 13.7 missed tackle. Um, and when we talk about traits, the reason they're talking about traits is uh, Dominique Hampton is... He's a 92nd percentile athlete. Um Elite size at 6'2", 215. Good explosion was 90th percentile in vertical jump. Uh, good speed, 81st percentile in speed. I know Rob Staten's a huge fan, so I, I'm, a, I'm a fan as well. Um, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, I don't know. I mean, Hampton, they said fourth round grade. Some of them have him as a seventh rounder. Time will tell. Time will tell. Um, last guy we were going, oh, sorry, two more guys, two more guys. Um, we'll talk about, we will talk about Kalen Bullock from USC. He's six foot two, 188 pounds. He is number eight at safety on, uh, Brugler's list, third to fourth round grade. Three-year starter at USC, Bullock played field safety and nickelback and former defense coordinator Alex Grinch's multiple scheme. Because of USC's depth issues, Bullock was pressed into action as a freshman, Emerged as a rare bright spot in otherwise beleaguered Trojans defense. I was going to say, I don't know if I want anyone off of that USC defense. Um, one of just eight FBS players with at least nine interceptions and two return touchdowns over the last three years. In coverage, Bullock has the sudden footwork and cornerback movement patterns to play over the top um, or cover in the slot and has wide receiver background shows with his ball tracking skills. He plays with urgency in the run game, but his top-down speed can be negated by below-average tackling mechanics and finishing strength. Overall, Bullock is a fast, twitchy athlete with split-field range to overlap verticals or spin to the post, but he needs to play with improved discipline and control to cut down the mistakes, specifically in the run game. Reminiscent of a leaner Trevor Morig. I don't know Trevor Morig. He has a starting NFL starting potential as his game continues to develop. He is a cornerback on some NFL draft boards. That's interesting. Where is he on Lance Zerline's list? He is the fifth safety on Lance Zerline's list. 6.16 grade. Good backup with the potential to develop into a starter. Long and athletic with a series of feast or famine plays all over the tape. Bullock can be scary good in coverage and scary bad as a run defender. He has the range to play single high safety. The athleticism to line up over the slot and the ball skills to chalk up impressive all on ball production as a run defender Bullock's poor recognition missed run fits and bad angles to the football cost his team chunk plays and touchdowns yikes 
He won't always see or process the game clearly, but the athleticism and playmaking talent are hard to overlook. He's young and talented, and if he runs well enough, there might be a team more interested in his skill set as cornerback than a boom-bust safety. That's the second mention of him as potentially as a cornerback. He is 97 on the PFF big board, had an 82.2 coverage grade, 49 run defense grade, 13.5% missed tackle rate. Bullock's lack of strength will limit how much of an NFL team can trust him to play early in his career. But if he gets stronger, he possesses elite range as an impactful single high safety for any defense, especially in cover three or cover one. Um, Let's take a check out his Raz. So he has a 63rd percentile RAS score, ranks 386 out of 1,060 prospects since 1987. He has great speed, 92nd percentile 40-yard dash, 448. Um, His explosion grade is just okay. He did not do agility testing. His size grade is okay. 91st percentile in height, but under one percentile in weight at 188. That is very light for the safety position. That's what they're talking about in adding size. All right, last guy, last guy. We are going to talk about Mr. Sioni Vaki. He is 18th on Brugler's safety list, sixth round prospect. <clears throat> Uh, sorry to clear my throat in the mic. That was rude. He says a two-year starter at Utah Vaki was a strong safety. Uh, after serving on his religious mission, he joined Utah prior to 22 season, brought infectious energy to the field as a safety and as a running back this past season because of injuries on Utah's offense. He led the defense in snaps in 2023, despite being the added role of playing running back as well. A finalist for the Hornung Award, giving to the college football's most versatile player. He became the first Utah defender with two rushing touchdowns in a single game since Eric Weddle in 2006. Offensive coordinator Andy Ludwig says, quote, I think the Eric Weddle comparison is very fair and accurate. Vaki flies, unquote, Vaki flies around the field with charged up play personality, tackling toughness to pick up ball carriers so long as he stays under control in pursuit. Though he has steady hands, his ball skills are inconsistent and spacing breakdowns and coverage were consistent across his game. Overall, Vaki plays with physicality and downhill speed. NFL coaches desire at safety, but his fluidity and instincts and coverage don't match up and will hinder his chances of earning steady defensive snaps at the next level. His potential as a core special teamer could be his ticket to the NFL. Again, six round grade. Where does Lance Zerline have him? Uh, he is like fourth worst safety in his list. He gives him a 5.68 grade, uh, which is a candidate for bottom of the roster or practice squad. Uh, he's a gamer who does whatever's necessary to help his team win. He carries a thick frame, good upper body power. Took on carries to help his team, blah, blah, blah. But he's not an NFL running back. Back, He's a conscientious tackler who is careful to center up and launch attack only when his realistic striking position. He's overmatched in coverage and struggles when playing roles downfield. Has below average athletic traits and lack of positional fit might create a limited path forward. PFF is higher on him. They have him as 101st on their big board. It's quite high. 69.2 69.2 coverage grade, 57.3 run defense, 14.3 missed tackle rate. If he fully committed to playing running back in the NFL, he has the physical gifts, athletic ability, and playmaker's vision to be a contributing player out of the backfield. So they seem to see him more as a running back um, than a safety. So I, I thought Vaki was kind of an interesting dude, but not early on, like late, late round kind of pick. So what did we learn today? I, here's where I'm at after we went through that. Um, one, I I like Cooper DeGean. I'm not saying he's got to be your first round pick, but I'm not going to freak out if he is. He seems like a really 
high upside player with high athleticism. Um, Jaden Hicks, a guy that we've already talked about, Rob Rang's high on, I think also would be a really interesting safety. These are guys, if you're going to take a safety in the first three rounds, these are the guys. If you want to take a guy that has starter potential, that's where you're going to have to take him. Javon Bullard, for me, also is a really interesting player. Um, Tyler Newbin, I mean, if you read the the scouting reports, it's like amazing and really appealing. I think uh, Daniel Jeremiah also has him as his top safety. I just, I really am concerned with a guy that has that that amount of athletic challenges um, and, and what that's going to mean to all those different playmaking things that he did in college. Cole Bishop, still an interesting player. I don't think I'm not interested in Cole Bishop in like the first three rounds, but if you can get him in fourth or fifth round, I think that's an interesting guy. Cam Kitchens, I have some concerns about his athletic profile. Um, I, I I I don't know. I mean, he he's coming in for a visit, so we'll see. But I wouldn't say he's off my board, but he's he's questionable. Malik Mustafa, a little bit of the bloom off the rose there for me. Seems like much more of a specialty player. Um, not a guy, unless you're playing a specific type of, of defense. I, I still would love to have him. Sounds like a fantastic guy and a big striker. And I like guys that play like that. Um, I think Mike McDonald would have to have a clear vision for what his, his position would be with the team. Uh, I think... Um, Otherwise, I don't know if there's anyone else that really changed my perspective significantly. Um, but I do think that there's some interesting safeties to look at in the mid to late rounds. Kalen Bullock's a guy that is is kind of interesting. I don't know where he'll be available at six foot two, but he's got the speed. And if you can put some weight on him, that might be a guy who's who's an interesting player later in the draft out of USC. And I had not spent as much time on him before. Um, all right, folks, this has uh, been great to go deep on safeties. Hopefully you learned a little. I know that I did. Um, if you haven't already, give the show a like, click subscribe. We want to keep growing the channel. Um, if you join the YouTube membership by clicking the link that is pinned to the chat as well as in the description of the video and go to patreon.com slash hawkblogger, sign up now, get access to the Slack channel, access to the audio version of all these podcast, which I will post immediately after I'm done here. Patreon.com slash Hawkblogger. Support the show. Really appreciate it. I'm Brian Nemhauser at Hawkblogger on Twitter. This has been another edition of the Hawkblogger Morning Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.